When there's only one thing I can do Well, you know that I still don't want to do it And love, I can find it again In someone sitting close In the flashes of sin There are other ways I used to think To find my way around The wood and the smell and the word of farewell That I always had to sound I'm Attica Scott and I live in the Parkland neighborhood. I'm a mom. I grew up in Beach Terrace and have lived in lots of different parts of Louisville. My name is Joe Dunman. I'm a civil rights attorney here in Louisville. I currently live in Hikes Point uh, and I grew up in the Crescent Hill neighborhood. I'm Dana Duncan. I live in the Southside neighborhood near Iroquois Park, formerly with Metropolitan Housing Coalition and just an engaged citizen. Uh, my name is Haven Harrington. I'm a, live in a Russell neighborhood, president of the Russell Neighborhood Association. The history of the 9th Street divide, um, I guess we'll probably start with urban renewal. Uh, around that time period where cities all over the country decided that uh, basically they were going to remove African Americans from their urban core and put them in their own neat little neighborhoods. Uh, we built the 9th Street Divide, made it really wide, it was an exit off the expressway. Uh, so, you know, some rumors I've heard were so that in case after the riots in the 60s and things of that nature, you can get the National Guard to uh, West Louisville faster. Uh, but as you can tell from driving around the city, uh, it pretty much uh, literally removed all the African Americans from downtown Louisville and um, pretty much destroyed the African American community that was downtown. Russell, uh, right now we say Russell's from 9th Street, from 32nd Street, from Market Street to Broadway. Well, the original boundaries of Russell were from 6th Street, right where you see the Louisville Gardens is now and the uh, River City Bank, which used to be Old Mammoth Life Building. That was all Russell. Those were all small mom and pop businesses, homes, housing. Now when you go back and look after urban renewal, that's everything's been torn down from 5th Street to 16th Street. Uh, there's no single family housing in between those blocks anymore in Russell, it's all been gone. And now the 9th Street Divide is not only a physical uh, barrier, it's also a mental barrier as well. As we hear folks all the time talk about uh, I can't go past 9th Street. There's nothing but crime in 9th Street. It is like night and day once you cross over 9th Street and you can see the difference in wealth. You can see the difference in investment in other parts of the city and you know that it literally just stops at 9th Street. When we talked about urban renewal growing up, it was treated like a, a natural force. Like it just happened. Like, you know, it, everything was going along, and then in, in the 50s and 60s, we just decided to tear everything down, and, and now it's, it's good for business. As I became an attorney and I started looking more into the history of things, what you find is that urban renewal was a part of a progression over the years of, like, purposeful segregation. Like, in the 19-teens, as the Jim Crow laws uh, started to pick up, there, in Louisville, there was an ordinance in place that said, look, there are white blocks and black blocks. If it's predominantly owned by white people, then only white people can buy property there. If it's predominantly owned by black people, only black people can buy there. And that was eventually struck down in a Supreme Court case called Buchanan versus Worley. But after those were struck down, they came up with a new plan. And the new plan was called restrictive covenants. So individual houses had deed restrictions that said, you can only sell this house to a white person, or you can only sell it to a black person. And so they, they used that to enforce segregation for years and years. Well, that got struck down by the Supreme Court in, the, in 1948. So they came out with a new, re a new way to do it. They called it the Housing Act of 49, and that's where urban renewal came from. And what they did was they defined certain sections of town as slums and blighted. And they said, well, if, if this part of town is declared a slum, you can just clear cut it. You can just destroy it, relocate all the, the people somewhere else, and then um, you know, put a parking lot or a bank there or something. It just so happened that most of the places declared slums and blighted were occupied by black people. You know, it's, it's not actually a coincidence, even though it, it seemed that way, you know, growing up 
thinking of it as a natural force. And so you have this concerted you know, legal effort to define property in a way that excludes certain people and includes uh, other people. You know, under the Constitution, the, the government can only take things as long as they, provide, they have a good public use for it and they provide you with uh, 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 remuneration. But they didn't have the public use. You can't just go clear out people's houses, so they needed the good public use. And that became increasing desirability and protecting us from slums and blighted conditions. So it's interesting that um, when there was political will to create laws to force segregation, we were able to do it. But then today, when it's time to create laws that help to address some of the issues that urban removal created, we can't seem to find the political will. So we find ourselves in situations now where um, people are unable to organize because of what urban removal did to right. communities um, west of 9th Street. And so when people come into our communities and decide that they want to do something like have a methane gas plant, then you find people scrambling together to try to fight back against that because the infrastructure for organizing just wasn't there because so many people have been displaced and because so many people have left West Louisville. So that base for organizing isn't necessarily there the way that it once was. But it's just interesting how historically we've been able to create the laws we wanted to create when it benefited certain people. But then today we have to struggle and, and fight to just get some halfway decent laws like wage increases and affordable housing and things like that. And I think along with what you're saying about the history is, you know, I'm not from Louisville, but in the years I've lived here, when I first saw pictures of the Russell neighborhood before urban renewal, urban removal, it was a revelation. You know, here was a business district, here was a thriving na urban neighborhood, businesses, pedestrians, I mean, it, it was the classic cityscape. And I think when we talk about it, sort of like with the methane plant, if you have people, people scattered from the neighborhoods, but also the rest of the community doesn't know that history. And when people talk about the Ninth Street Divide, don't go down there. We always talk about it from that point on, the removal onward. And nobody, I don't hear a lot of discussion of, gee, we've never seen this. I mean, do you remember this? This was a, a thriving neighborhood with businesses and local, you know, mom and pop shops and things. And we always start that discussion as though this is what the neighborhood has always been like. You have to start the discussion with that's what the neighborhood has always been like because that makes it easier to keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. rather than have to look at the history. It's like, well, this was once there. And because once you look at the totality of history, what was once Russell, what was once Portland, what was once California, then the justice is staring you right in the face. And now you have to look at it. You know, I always tell people, and people always complain about like, why can't you guys in the West End pick yourself up by your bootstraps and have economic development and all this other stuff. And I remind them, say, well, imagine if I went to Barstown Road from Broadway to Eastern Parkway and destroyed everything. I ripped out every business on Barstown Road from three blocks on either side of Barstown Road tore down everything, tore down all the single family homes, all the mansions, all the parks, all the businesses, and replaced it all with section housing. And then let's put a stopwatch and let's see, okay, let's see you guys recover from that. How do you recover from that? And you can't, you, you just can't. Well, and, and the business district that we have now is Dollar General and Family Dollar. Yes. Like that's what we're supposed to want in West But Louisville. then, but the other, the, other, the other side of that is the wealth that those families would have created for generation after generation after generation is not there. So you wiped out generations of African-American wealth with that as well. So the black middle class families that kind of grew up after that, which would be like me, I guess in the early 80s, mid 90s, and you know, my dad's generation, and especially my generation, we've decided to leave and gone to places like Atlanta that has a stronger black middle class. Because Louisville historically, and even now currently, does not do a good job of employing middle class or African Americans with probably middle class. And because of the way our economy builds now, we have a hard time employing white folks who are probably middle class. So now they're leaving too. What about the rich history that was in West Louisville before people were removed? And I think about the Parkland neighborhood and how exactly what you mentioned, Haven, happened. The National Guard came in. And from that point on, Parkland wasn't the historic business district that it once was. And I do my best to make sure that people know that history because 
we need to have the same kind of redevelopment that's happening in Russell, happening in Parkland, to say, you know what, now you have an area where 30% of the housing stock is abandoned or vacant. Now you have an area where there, year after year after year, there are multiple homicides and multiple shootings. And that wasn't the case before. And, and the unless the, the process. Exactly, yeah. and unless we have the investment from the business community and make it a priority from our governmental entities to rebuild neighborhoods like Russell and like Parkland, then what will happen is you'll have this piecemeal rebuilding of West Louisville, and you will continue to see people leave when they say, well, it's not happening in my, na my neighborhood. Ninth Street is, is our primary divide. I mean, as you said, you can drive around this town and within a minute. My mother, the first time she visited, was like, wow. And she grew up in so South Mississippi in the Jim Crow era, and even she was kind of knocked out by how visibly apparent it was how, that this is a, still a segregated city. But we have a lot of these. If you're south of 264, people think a certain thing. If you're west of 9th Street, and so part of that is the history. And you know, people were shocked by that there would be oh, but this methane plant, the food port, you know, this is a great thing, and not understanding the history of that neighborhood and why people would be upset and why you know just marching in with something and saying, but don't worry, this will be great. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think we have a community that is really interested and rooted in that history, we just need to be telling the stories that aren't being told. If you look at the, the census records from before urban renewal, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people living in the downtown area, and you mentioned the way things used to look, those neighborhoods that were declared to be slums and blighted looked like West Main Street looked. They, they were beautiful buildings, and man, you mentioned mansions. There were beautiful mansions all, all down the streets. One of the, the biggest forms of inequality we have in Louisville is not just income, but property value. Mm -hmm. You cross 9th Street and the house values drop dramatically. Mm -hmm. And you think when you own a house that's, that is valued at $220,000, you can get a loan for 70 and fix up your house and spend on whatever you need to do. When your house costs 40,000, mm -hmm. there's no equity in it. You can't, you can't improve it, even if you want to. If you have that drive to make your, your house nice, you can't afford it. And it, it had nothing to do with the housing stock in those neighborhoods because it was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It was the people who lived there. I mean, the banks went in and, on, and, and said, nope, black people live there, and they cross out the price. And the federal government supported this for years. And so you have that wealth, that middle class wealth is just taken. You know, and, and it's already been a struggle to get there in the first place because of slavery and Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And then you, you get to that point, you have it, and then suddenly the, the rug's pulled out from under you. If mm -hmm. your neighborhood's not totally clear cut, the house that you do own is worthless overnight. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the white neighbor, you know, the white people who lived in Shawnee and Chickasaw, they had nice, you know, high value homes. And then a black person moves in down the street and the bank decides, nope, your house is worth nothing now. And so they take off, they leave for the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this is, you mentioned structural, this is the structure that we have to combat. The reason these neighborhoods are poor is because they're declared by the forces that make those decisions that they're poor. Now we have to have, you know, white saviors come in with their investment dollars to save these neighborhoods mm -hmm. and improve them when the tools to give the neighbors who actually live there now, mm -hmm. give them their wealth back, exist, and we just don't. And we're supposed to be happy, right, that the saviors are coming in. Well, yeah, and, they're um, geniuses. They're, I mean, they discovered <laughs> Bring that. Bring it in environmental yeah. degradation. We're Businesses have low overhead that. in Portland, go figure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and now they, they've done, it dawned on them, now they can go gentrify and, mm -hmm. and, and move rich whites to take over that neighborhood mm -hmm. next, and mm -hmm. sorry, poor folks, find a yeah. new place to live. Bring so. in low-wage, dead-end jobs on 18th and Broadway. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be excited. That's right, mm -hmm. that's all you're gonna get Because we're supposed to have low expectations. And you also mentioned, like, this isn't just a black problem anymore. I mean, you, yeah. you have co white college grads getting out in Louisville with tons of debt, mm -hmm. and the best job they can get is $25,000 a year, yeah. no matter how smart they are or mm -hmm. creative. What do you do with twenty five thousand dollars a year? I mean, I, I, you know, before I went to law school, I was making thirty five, and they want to build luxury apartments downtown for this millennial upper class that just does not exist. I used to work for Tyler Allen, who was running for mayor. His big thing was light rail and streetcars. At the time, I really didn't get it. I kind of understood, like on an economic level, okay, the investment follows the tracks, and. And I kind of understood that, that argument of it. I know it's kind of a weird place to kind of start with streetcars, talk about the Ninth Street Divide. But the Ninth Street Divide is a, is a physical barrier. It, it is a physical thing. So they need, almost need another physical thing to push, to put things back together. Yep. 
And I think a lot of things with the city of Louisville has become mental, but it's also the, but the mental aspect of the Ninth Street Divide is reinforced by the physical aspect of the Ninth Street Divide. I think we can start stitching our city back together, building Russell back into downtown Louisville, building uh, California and Portland back into downtown Louisville, connecting West Louisville back with Southwest Jefferson County and start stitching the community back together because the expressways have kind of taken the inner city or the urban service district core and separated from the suburbs. Rather than put $150 million into the Omni Hotel, put $150 million into a streetcar system that would support all of Jefferson County. I, you know, I think it won't be, it won't be overnight, but I think eventually you would actually kind of start to see that breakdown of mental barriers once the physical barriers are broken down. Yeah, and, and the geography matters, and, and that those rail lines, when you go to a city like Washington, D.C., riding a train from your neighborhood to where you need to go, that rail line may take you through places you would not normally drive or see, and it can, it can help you. One of the best things in my life was being bused to Coleridge-Taylor and being able to see other neighborhoods that I would not have seen. I have hope for the mentality aspect of it because in my neighborhood, you know, it, Hikes Point, Bon Air. Bon Air was 99% white forever. My grandmother grew up there. My grandmother moved there. My dad grew up there. Seneca High School was all white. His neighborhood was all white. I have black neighbors for the first time in my life. And my white neighbors didn't leave. They didn't take off running. Okay. And it's, it's, we now, you know, and no one seems upset by it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, you know, black neighbors down the street, no one talks bad about, no one, oh yeah, I know him, he's great. You know, and that kind of mentality is shifting, I think, in, at least in pockets of town, that's very hopeful. So, Joe, you were bused to Coleridge-Taylor. I was. I started at Coleridge-Taylor when I lived in B2 Terrace and yeah, was bused to St. Matthews. So, um, busing. We, cro we crossed, the, crossed the yellow buses on the way. Yeah. That's right. I am hopeful that the way in which people are communicating differently today is going to help build some of the relationships that need to be built across the city. I mean, folks are realizing that they cannot depend on mainstream media to tell their story, so they're using social media mm -hmm. to tell their story, which means that people who are east of 9th Street are hearing stories about um, west of 9th Street that they otherwise wouldn't have heard before except for a homicide or a shooting. But now they're hearing, you know, there's actually good things that happen in West mm -hmm. Louisville. And then the way in which people are working together gives me hope, that people are working, working together um, across divides and are finding their commonality in those intersections. And because they're working together, they're realizing that they can do some things that they didn't believe that they could do before. So almost every day I have someone coming to me saying, I want to run for local or state office. I didn't feel like I could do that before as an activist, but now I see that I can. And so it's encouraging and it's inspirational to me to see that people are willing to step out there and be part of the systems that we need to change because we need people on the outside working to change systems, but we need people on the inside as well. Several, several, several leads in